stay on the same one. Yeah. Yep. I don't know. Yep. Thank you for joining us again. Sorry we've had technical problems here this morning with the internet. Hopefully it holds up. We'll swap to a different one. Uh, it's one of the joys of living in this beautiful region is uh, poor internet. <laughs> um, so beginner beekeeping, no such thing as a silly question. Put it in the comments below. We'll get to answering those. Trace is having a look to see uh, if there's any questions from before. But meanwhile, if you did write in a question, just please write it in again on the stream and we'll try and answer those. Hopefully the connection holds up. It's beginner beekeeping, so ask away. The whole idea is we help each other in this amazing pursuit of beekeeping. So if you know the answers to other people's questions, please chime in. Any questions? Fantastic. Well, Seeds, I've lost all my questions now, so this is when we have to, um, <laughs> I'll have to get my brain into action. Just wondering, with the new Flow Hive 2s and the Ant Guards, do they come with both the Flow Hive 2 and the Flow Hive 2 Plus? It's a question for you, Chase. Oh. The, uh, <laughs> so the Ant Guards are these little new things uh, on the bottom here that you can fill with oil. Our Flow Hive 2 Plus comes with these. Uh, but it is something you can purchase to add to all of our Flow Hive 2s as well. The idea is you, you raise the top just by spinning it up like that, put a little bit of oil in there or, or uh, Vaseline grease, and what will happen is it creates an ant barrier. Of course it doesn't work if you've got foliage touching your hive that the ants can walk up or, or mulch uh, touching here, so you do have to um, uh, add some maintenance in order to keep them as an ant barrier. Great. Now these uh, questions are coming in now, so we're all we're firing again. So you don't. Okay. Really good. Good. Sorry about that, everyone that had to retune into the stream. Hopefully it holds up this time. Exactly. A couple of questions um, sort of relate to each other. Advice for beginner beekeepers, and also good books that you would recommend for beginner beekeepers, or courses, or other things to do. Okay, if you like to learn online, then we've put a lot of effort into creating what we call the beekeeper.org, which is experts from all around the world and us have made amazing video content to really take you and train you from knowing nothing at all to a deep, even scientific knowledge of beekeeping. And that one is a, also a fundraiser for habitat regeneration and uh, to advocacy for our honeybees. So it's pretty cool. It gets rave reviews and we're very proud of it. So if you do want to check that out, the beekeeper.org is the place to, to look at that. Now, as far as books go, um, there, there is a lot of great books out there and we do have a recommended reading spot on our website to, to uh, recommend books uh, for people to sink their teeth into and learn that way. Great. So Daniil's asking, could you make hives out of a UV protected PVC? Uh, you could. Um, I'm not a big fan of PVC because it um, does have issues with phthalates and things in it. Um, PVC is the one we use for our down pipes and I'm not sure why we use it for water because it's, uh, it's a bit nasty in terms of um, it's what leaches out of that type of plastic. Um, so I wouldn't use PVC, but there are certainly um, things that you can use to do more of an artificial type beehive. And there's companies that make plastic uh, outer uh, skins for their beehives and complete plastic modules and styrofoam. It's a personal preference, but uh, I prefer wood. It mimics the natural tree hollows and it's just a, a beautiful, sustainable product, provided you're getting it from a sustainable source. Great. See, so, you know, Jason, um, just sending us lots of love, loving the hive, loving the beautiful invention, and also harvested four frames, and within a week they filled up again. He lives in Sydney, so that's pretty amazing. Ah, uh, fantastic. Springtime here in Australia, so it's a, a real joy when you've been looking after your bees and they're building up, you've been watching them through the windows, doing their amazing job of dewatering the honey and then you get that beautiful experience of the honey flowing out. So well done and for some reason the honey from your local area always tastes better. So um, see if you can describe the flavour to us. Well done and it's even more exciting when a week later as you say they're full again. 
And you get that in the season. You get this amazing synergy between a great nectar flow where the flowers are dripping to the ground with nectar and a colony that's really strong and ready to go and get it. And equally, you get long periods and you have to be very patient where there's no honey they're storing. But that's what it's all about. Right, Cedar, what ties ask you what line of bees do we use or have? So it's usually a bit of a mix in our hives and Apis mellifera is the, is the scientific name for the European honeybee which humans have dragged all around the world wherever they go. There is other species like um, Apis uh, japonica uh, which is a, a Japanese honeybee that also can use flow hives with some modifications but generally the honeybee is Apis mellifera but within that there's breeds of bees that beekeepers have bred and there's the, um, there's the black bee uh, originating from, from Ireland and uh, there's also ones they call Italian bees then there's Caucasian bees and there's Carnolians but really they end up a bit of a mix often in your hive because the queen will mate with 30 or so fathers and that gives you a bit of genetic diversity in your hive. Right. So what's the best way to prevent a swarm or is it inevitable? So the best thing that I like to do is take a split in the springtime. So the springtime is when the bees really breed up and during that time they're, uh, they're getting crowded and when you open the windows sometimes you cannot even see the comb because there's so many bees in there and that is a one of the triggers for them to swarm also if you don't have enough area for your bees to uh, for your queen to lay eggs in the bottom so harvesting honey helps but one of the main uh, things to do is to make some more space in your brood box the best thing I like to do is take a split so you take half of the frames out or maybe not quite half of them out into another box and you start another hive. If you don't want another hive somebody else surely will and you've done two things. You've uh, slowed down that swarming tendency and you've also created another hive. So there's other things you can do. Some people don't want to create another hive and they'll just cut out some comb from in the brood nest and free some space and perhaps they'll add another box or two to the hive. So there's things you can do if you don't want to create a split, but my favourite thing to do is take a split in the springtime. Great, and on that uh, question, Cedar, Jessica's asking, they just did a split, um, and just wondering now how far away should they put the, new, the split hive from the parent hive if the new hive is maybe currently queenless? Okay, you should put it... Uh, the weaker one, which is probably the one without the queen, getting the lion's share of the returning foragers. So if your hive was here, you took out half of the frames and put a brood box beside it, then I would move the parent hive over and put the new one in the flight path where the existing one was. So one of the first things we usually do when we take a split is pick up the uh, hive you're taking the split from move it over just about a hive width and then start making a split right in the flight path where the bees are returning home. That way you'll get uh, more likelihood of success where the weaker hive is getting a lot of foragers returning who then will take on other jobs in the hive like building comb and looking after uh, the brood when, when there is a laying queen and so on. Sure. Um, Cedar Sean's asking, just received a nuke and transferred the frames into their, to, uh, their flow hive. When's the best time to install the flow frames and allow the bees into that area? Okay, the best time is when the brood box is nice and full. So that means all the frames in the bottom box are drawn out. I'll just uh, take off this top box to show you what that looks like. So if I, if I pick up this box here and put it aside, there's a whole lot of wooden frames in here. Now, what you want to do is make sure that all of these frames are drawn out. And when I say drawn out, it means the bees have created their wax comb in this area here. And when all of the frames are drawn out and you've got lots of bees in your box, that's the time to put the super on. You could put it on earlier if you're in a warm climate, but 
The best time is when they're ready for it, and that's when this is nice and full with bees and comb. Great. Cedar, so, this is um, this is from Shannon. This is um, they've got hives for heroes for the veterans um, who have come with PTSD, and they just want you to give them a shout. -out. Hey, well done. That's a fantastic thing to be doing. Is is keeping bees and looking after them, and there's so much. Uh, it's just such a rewarding thing to do, to be able to do some beekeeping and, and taste all the beautiful honey flavours of the season that comes in. Uh, and the flow hives is just um, yeah, a great way to also observe, say, well done. Thank you very much for, for getting in there and uh, looking after our honey bees. Yeah, great hives for heroes, fantastic. Cedar, Kat's asking about to paint the flow hive roof and can see that we've got sort of blues and different colours. Are there any colours that you would recommend? Look, the bees don't care which colour it is. It's more of an aesthetic thing for you. I wouldn't go too dark. I wouldn't go black if you're in a really hot climate. You can get into the situation where there is just get, getting too much heat into the hive. So if you've got your hive in a full sun, you've painted the roof black, it might get a bit hot. It is wood, so it does have natural insulation, and we've got more insulation than a lot of standard hives because we've got this cavity up here like a house has, and then the inner cover under that. But even so, I wouldn't go really dark. So choose your colour, have fun, and the bees won't care. Um, Fred, Fred Dunn's joining us again and saying that it's so nice to see that it rains here sometimes because they're knee-deep in snow over there in the States. Wow, okay, <laughs> knee-deep in snow already, that's amazing. We don't get uh, snow here at all. We do get snow in Australia in um, what we call uh, the Mount Kosciuszko area, which is hardly a mountain on world standards, but nevertheless we get some snow there. And um, but around here we're far from getting anything like snow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. See, the Jasmine's wondering: what, is it safe to move the hive, the bees, over a long distance? People move hives all the time, especially commercial operators, and they move them thousands of kilometres. Now it's about how you do it. So. If you've got to move house and you're going more than six miles, uh, uh, 10 kilometres away, then um, all you do is, is get out there in the very early morning, use a bit of smoke to get your bees to go in, close the entrance, make sure they're well ventilated, strap your hive up, and then you can transport it on the back of uh, a, a, a vehicle or a trailer and you can move your hive that way. People do that all the time. If you're doing short distances, then there's a whole lot of, of things you have to consider. One is that bees really geo-lock to the position. So if you're going a long distance, they won't recognise the surroundings, so you can just move it. But if you're going a short distance, you'll have to consider that. Now, you can move just a couple of metres at a time and the bees will fly back to this area where the hive was going, hang on, where's my hive? But they'll work it out because it's only just over there. If you're moving more than a couple of metres, then the technique I use is a disorientation technique where you just move the hive across your yard to the other side and at the entrance you break a whole lot of branches or you tape an old t-shirt over the front and what happens is the bees come racing out and they hit this obstacle in front and then they go, hang on, something's different, and they reorientate to that new location. Works quite well, you still get 5% of bees returning to the old spot. You can either let them work it out, or you could put a box there to collect the bees and then ferry them to the new position uh, every couple of days. For, and that'll go on for uh, four or five days so there's no bees returning to the old location. But to me, that technique is easier than doing a double move, moving it 10 kilometers away, waiting a month and then moving it back. So that's the technique I mainly use. Great. Trevor um, has bought his, their third flow hive. Um, and just wondering, will the flow hive two base fit on the hybrid hive? So it will. That's, uh, that's, you can do that. Now, the flow hive two base, um, the dimensions will be close enough. Uh, but it'll sit just inside because 
When we started, we had a whole lot of different sizes uh, because we were manufacturing in multiple countries and we started, if you remember, uh, overnight in a bit of a, a whirlwind with, with uh, 20,000 uh, orders or so overnight. <laughs> and uh, so we had to get going really fast. And then we decided that um, we would change our flow hive two to be the same dimensions as our Australian production of our cedar hives. So what that meant is there is discrepancies between the models still. Hopefully we'll sort that out sooner rather than later. But it's not enough to worry you. It'll sit just a couple of mils inside if you center your hybrid body on top of a Flow Hive 2 base. Great, and Jason's just tuned in the, the, um, the ape beekeeper from Sydney said the honeys tastes like toffee. Toffee, well done. Mm. So, so he's harvested his first four frames and they filled it up again in a week. I'd be curious to know whether that, when they filled it up whether there was a flavour change because you get this beautiful thing where you have some frames and they fill it up with whatever's flowering next and you get this checkerboarding of different colours and flavours in your hive and it's nice to be able to isolate them uh, frame by frame. Conventionally I used to harvest 20 hives or so into just one big uh, extractor and put that into buckets. But in doing so, you lose the joy of really isolating the flavours, which to me is, is one of the real joys of honey, is to be able to really taste differences and share that and have the conversations that come up around the different flavours and colours of honey when you show off your, your wares to your guests. <laughs> Cedar um, Honig Trail Apiary from um, Arizona has just tuned in and just wondering when it's raining since the flow hive is slightly slanted to the rear, is water coming into the hive much of an issue? Okay, what we did there is we slanted the entrance to limit that. However, you do get splash that does get into the hive regardless of us having a downward sloping landing board and a downward sloping uh, uh, piece of the mesh bottom board here as well. What happens is it will go into the tray at the bottom so it's good because it's not sitting inside the hive wetting your bees but it does mean after heavy rain just clean out the tray in the bottom of your hive and that will just mean there's less, uh, less of a water pool in that tray at the bottom or you can take the tray out altogether. Uh, many beekeepers around the world just go open mesh, no tray in the bottom, even in snowy times. So it's up to you, uh, but experiment and see what works for you. So the Rachel's asking, will the newly split hive that um, we were talking about before create their own queen? They will. Well, they usually do, I should say, and hopefully they do. So if you've put some of the frames from your Let's say this is the original hive and this is the split you're taking. Then you, you would take perhaps half of the frames out of here and you would make sure that there's eggs down some of the cells in both hives. Now to do that you're going to need to look right into the light, get the light shining down the cells and you're looking for these little bee eggs in the bottom. It's quite a, a, a beautiful thing to be really tuning in with your bees at that level. And if you do spot eggs, then it's great. You need at least some eggs in both hives because the hive without the queen will need to start with eggs or very young larvae in order to raise a queen. The way it works is bees will feed their, their young. They'll feed it royal jelly in the beginning for the first three days. And if they continue to feed royal jelly, it'll turn into a queen. As soon as the bees are, or the larvae is fed plant proteins through epigenetics, they turn into a worker bee. So the bees can choose to make a queen, but only if they've got the resources to do so, meaning some eggs or very young larvae under three days old in the hive. Cedar, so Jess is asking, what's the best position to put your beehive in? So the best position, I think, is one where the flight path isn't going to bother anybody. Now, commercial beekeepers will often orientate their hives so the sun streams into the entrance in the morning, wakes them up, gets them up early. 
Now that might increase production by 5%, which is useful if, you're, if that's your livelihood. But for most of us as, as uh, backyard beekeepers, that becomes not such a priority. And the priority is more so it's a nice hive to be around and nobody's going to get stung walking into their flight path. So choose a position that hopefully gets a bit of sun at least in the morning because that's nice for your hive just to, to, to warm up and dry out a bit. Limits things like chalk brood. So if you had a choice between full sun or full shade, I'd go full sun. The ultimate positioning is some shade in the afternoon, especially in the summertime. And that'll just help your bees uh, in cooling their hive on those really hot summer days. And the flight path, uh, not where humans or pets are usually walking. Right, Cedar Mike's asking, should they uh, paint the inside of the flow hive or just the outside? We like to just paint the outside and leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees. However, it is up to you. Commercial beekeepers generally do paint the inside of their hives as well. And the reason they do that is to get as long lasting boxes as possible, especially if they're using uh, uh, pine hives that might not last so long. So they usually dip them in, in, in uh, copper and things like that to, to limit the um, fungus and things rotting away the hives and then they'll paint them inside and out with the cheapest house paint they can get hold of from, from the local store and uh, the bees are fine. So if you do want to paint the inside, go for it. Your bees will be okay. That's conventionally how it's been done. But what we do is we just leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees, but it's up to you. See, so Gary said he's been told, so he's got two frames in the brood box that are full of honey, and someone told him that they will move that honey up into the super. Is that correct? They will move honey if they need more space to lay their eggs. Now, it's, uh, you can get into the situation where you get what's called honey bound, where in the springtime they're trying to find space to lay, but the whole hive is so full of honey, the top's full of honey, the bottom's full of honey, and they've got nowhere to move it. There's bees bringing back more honey, more nectar from the flowers, and there's nowhere to put it, and that can be one of the triggers of swarming. So if your brood box is honey bound, especially in the springtime, then get in there and take out some of the honey frames, which are usually on the edges. If you're using naturally drawn comb, you can just cut it straight out like this and uh, take that honey away and put the frame back in somewhere towards the middle, and that will give your queen more spaces to lay. Fantastic. See, the ruby did a bit of a harvest and just had a bit of honey coming through um, into the brood box. Any tips on that, and, and is that a problem? Okay, so a little bit's not a problem. Bees are used to that over the years. Uh, harvesting conventionally, you're often breaking comb as you open lids and so on, and the bees are effective at cleaning up honey spills inside the hive. If you're getting a lot, you know, I mean, talking litres of honey uh, flowing through the hive, then there's probably something wrong with your setup. And touch and we'll go through a troubleshooting procedure with you but things to look out for is that you've got the slope right on your hive. We we'll put levels on the side of our flow hive too to help you with that. You want the level bubbles in the middle to get that three degree slope backwards and uh, another thing you can do is to, if it's a concern is just harvest um, one or two frames at a time that way if you do get any spills it'll be limited and your bees will be able to clean that up easily. Right. See, this Shannon's asking, if you're introducing a new queen into a hive, because um, you know the hive, do the bees push the old queen out if they haven't swarmed and look after the new queen to make a strong, strong colony? They do. So what they'll do in the springtime is they start raising a new queen. Now, they do that by making queen cells. And we've just got a picture here that Jai uh, has conveniently just placed here courtesy of Hilary Kearney and that is a queen cell. We're not inside a hive today because it's quite a rainy day. But you can see that peanut type shape here hanging down. So that's a queen cell, that's a queen cell and that's a queen cell and all of these other ones are cells that can be used for, for a, a, either honey storage, pollen storage or worker brood. Now the uh, what happens when they swarm is the colony, whatever, however they decide, 
they decide to swarm and they will actually kick out the old queen and off they go. But they usually won't do that until they've got a new queen ready to go in the hive. And uh, she will then emerge into the hive and go through a mating uh, flight in the next week or two. And hopefully then you have a new virile mated queen in your hive that swarmed. And it will take a, a month or so for them to build up again. If they don't build up, many months go by, then you could have a problem with a new queen. Perhaps she uh, isn't laying very well, or perhaps uh, perhaps um, she doesn't make it for whatever reason, and you'll need to, to rectify that by putting a new queen. Sita, what does an egg look like if she's laying well? So an egg, it looks like a tiny little grain of rice in the bottom of the cell. There's a nice picture of it here. This is a, a sort of a blown up example of it. but. If you've ever looked down a cell, this is a very fresh new wax in this picture here. And it's, uh, this is a honeycomb cell measuring only about five millimeters across. So you can imagine how small this is. This is uh, about two millimeters in, in length here, this little egg. So you'll be able to look down and see those. And hopefully they're at the bottom of the cell like this. If you're seeing them on the side walls and things, then you've possibly got an issue with workers laying. If the hive doesn't have a queen, sometimes the workers will lay unfertilized eggs all over the place, but their abdomens aren't long enough to get to the bottom of the cell, and that's how you can work it out. And those male bees, our drones. Great. See, do the drone bees fit through the queen excluder? The drone bees don't fit through the queen excluder. So uh, that is a, um, a thing actually. So the, the, the uh, drones get stuck in the bottom with the queen. They're, they're even slightly bigger than the queen. Uh, and drone bees don't have stingers either. Let's see if we can spot a drone in here somewhere. So it's fun playing a bit of uh, a bit of Where's Wally, or I think in the States they call it Where's Waldo. <laughs> but there's a queen here we can spot with her shiny back plate and her longer abdomen here. And the drones, they have bigger eyes that meet together in the middle. And I'm not spotting any here on this frame. And the, the bodies are sort of big and more teddy bear shaped. They don't do many chores around the hive. Their job is to spread their genetics and to uh, hopefully mate with a queen one day if they're lucky enough to do so. Oh, those photos look so good. Um, Cedar, will the bees just find the hive over, over time and just move in or do you have to actually install bees into it? Okay, hive? great. That's a, a very common new question. The answer's long like a lot of things in beekeeping you've got uh, the answer is sometimes it can happen but i wouldn't rely on that as a method to to uh, get going because it's called a bait hive when you allow the colony to find your hive you can increase your chances of getting a a uh, what's called a bait hive going by putting a, a brood box like this with a lid on it, don't put the top box on and put it near an existing apiary with lots of hives in springtime and you might be lucky and the bees move in. It's much more reliable to buy some bees off a beekeeper or take a split from a friend. Catching a swarm in the spring. Cedar, so once you cut out that honeycomb um, in the brood box, do you need to clean those frames before you put them back in? If you're using naturally drawn combs like these ones, then you don't really need to um, do any cleaning at all. Imagine the comb in here, then you're simply just cutting it out and because you've taken all the old comb away, you can just put that straight back in. Sometimes you might want to clean a bit of burr comb off the top here 
but there's, there's no need to clean all of this. In fact, the little bit of comb left on this strip here will help them get a nice straight start as they hang their comb. So it's quite an easy thing to do. You just get your knife or hive tool and you run around here, chop it out, take it away. Don't leave it out for the bees. Make sure you're taking that away. Enjoy eating that honeycomb. Save the wax for making candles. And this goes straight back in for the bees to reuse. Now if you're using wire and foundation which is a conventional way to do it then what you'll need to do is prepare a frame with wire and foundation and then you'll swap it for the other one and then you'll take the other one back and clean it up. It's a bit boring because you end up with all these old frames to clean up and rewire and wax nevertheless that's the way it's mostly done. We like to do naturally drawn comb for a couple of reasons. One is that you don't have to do all of that te tedious work, but uh, there's no need for us to have all of that, that wire foundation in the frames because we're not putting these frames in a centrifuge. So there's an example of a naturally drawn comb. And you can see here that um, they've just got the, the wooden comb guide starter strip at the top and the bees make this beautiful comb themselves. Fantastic. That looks so great on camera. Um, Cedar, we've got a local Jane's tuned in from Riverside down here in Brunswick and just wondering, there's lots of rain about. How long, if the rain keeps going, can the bees just stay in the hive without sort of going out and foraging? Uh, they can and they will. So bees are, are quite resource for. So if you think about where be these honeybees have originated from, they've come from Europe where there's long cold winters and they can stay in the hive for many months at a time and they're fine. And that is why they store so much honey. And lucky for us, they store more than they need a lot of the time and we can share some too. So your bees will be fine. They'll in there, they'll, they'll eat some honey and on the next available opportunity, you'll see a frenzy of activity when the sun comes out and bees out the front and the new bees will be doing their orientation flights, bees that need to go to the toilet because they're, they're very polite and they don't uh, go in the hive. They'll be, they'll be flying out and taking that moment and that's those little yellow dots you sometimes see uh, are actually bee poo and you'll find them out the, the front of the hive sometimes. Yes, I get those yellow dots on the washing all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if your hive's near your washing line, yeah, exactly. you might get a few yellow dots. They're, they're getting more and more trendy these days, so <laughs> just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> See, that Andrew's asking, um, wanting to introduce a, a new swarm into a pre-used flow hive. Just wondering, do they need, does he need to worry about cleaning the flow frames? There's a few dark patches in the cells, or will the bees just work that out themselves? Okay, They're, generally the bees are the best to, to clean the frames. However, if they've gotten really gunky, like let's say when you took them inside and, and maybe the hive beetles got into it or there was some fermentation that occurred, then, then flush it out with hot water, let them dry out and then put them in. But if they're, if they're just discoloured from the general use of the bees and the wax and the propolis, then that's fine. The bees will still use them and they'll get in there and they'll be a lot better than you at uh, cleaning and polishing the cells. Um, any thoughts said on using Apithor to control hive beetles? Okay, so Apithor is a, an insecticide beetle trap. It's very common for people to use those. We've got this uh, pest management tray in the bottom of the hive here, so we don't need to use it. However, if you've got bad hive beetles, uh, it is one thing you can do if you're not opposed uh, to using those type of insecticide traps. You can use the Apithor hive beetle traps. Um, just make sure they don't get water in them. You don't want to get into the situation where uh, they're on the bottom board of a hive without a screen bottom board. A lot of rain blows in the entrance and the chemicals then leak out and you'll have a whole lot of bees dying from the leaching of the insecticide onto your bottom board. So a few things to look out for, but I believe they, uh, they are one way of controlling the hive beetle and do work well. 
see the how do bees find flowers in the first place? So bees are amazing. They're, 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 they do this process of discovery. So one of the jobs that bees get is being a scout bee. So what happens is the scouts go out into the, uh, into the wild looking for flowers and they've got vision of ultraviolet, which means flower petals really stand out to them. And they'll be looking for flowers at, in up to a 10 kilometer radius. Now, if that scout bee finds a good source of either nectar or pollen, in this case, it looks like this bee's found a good source of uh, nectar, but it's also collecting some pollen. And why I say that is it's got its proboscis down deep into the flower here, where the flower's letting go its nectar to attract the bees for pollination. It's a beautiful piece of symbiosis. But if you have a look here, we've got this big pollen bag on its hind leg. So what happens is the bees have an electrostatic charge. As they approach the flower, pollen grades jump right off the flower on to the fuzzy body of the bees. And bees even have those hairs on their eyeballs. What happens then is the bees will scrape those little pollen grains towards their back legs. And I don't know how they do it, but they manage to build it up into what we call a pollen basket on their hind legs. Here's a bee on Hilary Kearney's hand that is covered in pollen. Look at that. Isn't that a beautiful example of the pollen grains jumping off the flower onto a bee? Now she's got to go through a process of cleaning herself up getting all of that pollen organized into her pollen baskets, which is a little spur on her hind leg. And she'll collect and collect till she's got big, big uh, pollen baskets, and then she'll fly that back to the hive, along with probably a nectar load in her honey stomach. But what happens is those bees go back to the, the flowers. Now, it's an incredible process of of communication where those scout bees go home into the hive in the dark and somehow they do this incredible dance where they're shaking their tail is equal to about a, a kilometer of distance now they also move about in these amazing patterns you can see here and using the direction and gravity they'll be able to communicate how far to fly and also which direction to fly according to the sun. So if, if this was straight up, for instance, that would mean, if, and as they waggle, that would mean the, the uh, flowers are in the direction of the sun. But if it was 20 degrees to the left of straight up, that would be 20 degrees to the left of where the sun is. So they're constantly adjusting their communication to reflect very accurately where the flowers are. So it's quite amazing that these honeybees have got it so organized that they can communicate to such a level and really utilize big nectar flows when they come. And that's how they can collect an amazing amount of honey and we can then share in some too. <laughs> That is so good. They don't need Google Maps, do they? <laughs> no, they don't need Google Maps. So um, somehow they're amazing communicators and I believe their communication is so much more advanced than we know. This is what we've worked out so far, but we're learning more all the time about the honeybee and their amazing abilities to communicate. See the Jeff's in Santa Cruz in California where the weather is relatively warm, so the temperature's not a problem. Just wondering, is it a good idea to remove the super if the frames are empty getting, when they're getting ready for winter? Okay, so it's a great question to ask your local beekeepers. Here we don't have to remove the frames, we don't get a really long cold winter, but in places where you're going to have deep snow, it is common to reduce the size of your hive. Now, often people stack up hives quite tall in those cold places with multiple boxes, and they might reduce it right down to just a configuration like this for the winter time where you've got uh, one or two boxes for your hive. But that information is best uh, from your local 
beekeepers with local knowledge about how much honey you need to leave for your bees to survive the winter or whether you need to take your brood box off. You might decide to leave your flow frames on but take the queen excluder out for the winter so the queen is free to move up with the, the bees and she won't perish below the excluder. There's a few options for you and it's ask three beekeepers uh, you get six opinions so it's a little bit like that but in the end find out some local knowledge try and see what works hear from you guys in the comments how many boxes high have you seen a beehive stack uh, yeah that's my nephew jai behind the camera charming in there how many how many boxes do you keep on your hive it's common in colder areas for people to stack one two three four five boxes high because the flow frames are uh, a little bit of a paradigm shift for beekeepers because you can store honey in jars on the shelf rather than storing it in boxes on the hive. You don't need to wait to, to process in batches like you do conventionally, which means you can run with less boxes, less equipment to maintain, less space used up in your shed with a whole lot of honey supers that are there half the year and uh, it's, it can be a bit of a mentality shift for existing beekeepers but some people are really enjoying the fact that they can just keep harvesting from their flow hive rather than stacking more boxes on as the season goes on. So um, um, Jael's tuned in from Brisbane because we're obviously having as much rain as we are. Just wondering if you ever considered doing a floating version of the flow hive. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's a pretty fit. I have unfortunately had a beehive flow down a uh, creek at my place when it was flooding. And that was simply because I'd caught a swarm and I hadn't got around to moving it into the rest of the apiary. It's sitting there on a muddy uh, a sort of, well, it wasn't muddy at the time, but it got muddy and uh, the um, bricks and things they had it on toppled over. The hive went down the bank into the flood water and floated away. And I do wish I had a, a, a floating beehive contraption at that point. Um, but uh, those, uh, that hive I thought was going to make it, but in the end they were a bit too far gone by the time I got to them. So that was sad. We have had one of our staff members, Jed, who looks after a lot of our um, IT things in, in, in the hive. He had three hives completely flooded because he lives, well, at the time he lived in an area that goes completely underwater when you have a big flood. And he had some great photos of actually rescuing those hives out of the flood water. And they did all survive because he got to them quick enough. But yes, um, not ideal to have hives floating in flood water, but we, uh, so most if you're here in the northern rivers, we do have some flooding type rain happening at the moment. <laughs> so you're getting started for a new beekeeper. Should you just get the flow hive or is it good to get the starter kit? And if so, what other equipment would you need? It is great to get the starter kit because it comes with the bee suit and the smoker and the hive tool and everything you need to get started. You're gonna to have to put your hive together. You will have to go and find whatever paint you want for your hive and, and then go and get your bees. The idea is it gives you the, the basic starts. Make sure you're getting a, a beekeeping suit and a veil and all of those things that you do need to get started. So often people do like to start with the starter kit, a little more cost effective as well. And we do have a special on that at the moment, I believe. <laughs> we, well, we did our Black <laughs> Friday special, um, but we always do have some bundle special usually for sale. So, um, and just when customer support, they'll help you out anyway. Always good to help you. Um, I love it now. We've got um, Katinia's, I probably said the name completely wrong, is tuned in from the UK. And with the time difference, um, I'm always quite impressed when people like that tune in because she normally has to watch it afterwards, but has actually managed to tune in live from the UK. So that's pretty epic. Fantastic. Uh, let us know what time it is there. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's surely not a great time of day. <laughs> oh, I know, exactly. But not to tune in. Um, we've, um, Fred has been talking a little about the small hive beetle and, and um, Chuck's actually tuned in. Chuck Rao, also another one of our ambassadors. Um, wondering if the chickens help foraging near your hive actually help control the small hive beetles. 
Yes, great, Jack. Uh, so people do find that they can keep their hives in their chicken pen and it does help because uh, they'll get in there and they'll peck the, the, the small hive beetles and, and bugs and things and if larvae is in the ground they'll peck them as well. So, uh, but I have heard also some issues where um, you can get an aggressive hive attacking the chickens. So it's probably a bit unusual but um, keep an eye out for that as well. Now Fred Dunn's got a history in chickens as well as a lot of beekeeping so perhaps he could chime in with a great answer to that question. <laughs> so Matt's saying a uh, hive has swarmed five times this year, is that normal? Um, or does it, what does it say about the strength of the, of the hive that he's got? Any tips on that? Okay, so when that happens it's a genetic thing. So you can get genetics and you do get genetics that are very swarmy. Some beekeepers, when they catch a swarm for that reason, will we'll, uh, let them build up and then replace the queen because they don't want to bother catching swarms all the time, losing bees, especially if you're in suburbia, uh, bees taking off over the neighbor's fence again and so on. So what I'd recommend if they're that swarmy and that's becoming a problem is changing your queen for some known genetics from a queen breeder and that way you'll change over to some less swarmy genetics and uh, that problem will go away. Ben's saying that the, um, the flow hive's going really awesome, awesome, but a nuke of his has got little grubs everywhere. I'm just wondering how to get rid of them. I'm not quite sure what the grubs are. Okay, so the grubs could be small hive beetle. Now, if you're seeing grubs falling to the floor of your nuke, then you're, you've got an issue. The hive beetles are really taking hold. What you do if to save your colony is you need to take all the honey away and all the pollen away. So just leave only the ones with the brood and go back to blank frames either side. And that way the remaining colony in there has a much better chance of looking after your bees. The hive beetles like to lay in the frames and you need to just minimise the amount of area that the bees uh, have to look after and that's the way to rescue that hive. So get in there, if you've got signs of the small hive beetle taking over, um, little maggoty grubs falling to the floor, you've really got to get onto that to save that colony. Cedar, um, Karen's a bit concerned about the bees, that they may be getting ready to swarm, but there's so much rain. Just wondering, do bees actually swarm in the rain? They're unlikely to swarm in the rain because they, they're, what they're doing when they're swarming is looking for a new colony and they go through this process of hanging on a branch. Scout bees go out from the swarm ball and they go and find a, a new location. Now it's not ideal to hang all wet in the rain so they generally will choose a nice warm sunny day to swarm. <laughs> Cedar, um, oh, I love this, um, it's called Extreme Rush Blends and they're from the USA and they help crowdfund us those hives. So that's pretty exciting. Amazing. I love it when we hear those stories. That's great, thank you so much. That's why we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> so Cedar, if the bees aren't swarming and it's getting really overcrowded, what will happen? Will they just stay there until the sun comes out? They will. So what you'll find is as the nectar uh, flow changes, the queen will throttle her egg laying. So naturally they'll find balance and the numbers will, will uh, reduce again as the season ebbs and flows with the nectar. So it, if, if it's not in swarm season, there's a lot of bees. In the evening they're boiling up out the front. Generally I would just leave it and as time goes on the numbers will change to more reflect uh, the nectar flow and the size of your hive. Cedar, with the, with the flow hive 2 and the 2 plus uh, with the legs, would you also recommend putting it on pavers or bricks or something so it doesn't maybe sink into the ground and float y away? Yes, <laughs> a great idea, especially in these wet times. Make sure there's a good footing. If you've got soft ground, let's uh, all of these hives in the garden down here uh, have a, a, uh, a paver under each foot otherwise the garden soil is simply too soft and your hives will be constantly sinking down especially when bees bring in their amazing amount of honey hives can get very heavy you don't want hives toppling over especially when it gets nice and wet 
What about cedar um, building an extra cover over your hive? Would that help with the weather and help with the bees flying out or not? Certainly, if you have the situation where you can put your hives under a, a roof like, like here, then that will make your wood uh, last longer. Your bees will love it. They'll get less uh, wet and damp. And in some countries, they, ha they keep bees like that in what they call honey houses, where the, the beehives are all on the walls with the bees flying out. And inside, they have their honey harvesting and extracting room. And it's a whole house dedicated to bees. So that's a certainly, uh, there's a history of roofs over beehives in, in a lot of countries. Ah, oh, fan fantastic. Getting lots of good feedback about the black and yellow sale that we had um, thanks to our awesome campaign media team here in Flow headquarters. Okay, fantastic. Jai behind the camera put a lot of effort into that. And uh, we, we, we did a, a great thing where we harvested with one jar filling into the next and into the next and into the next. And it was live that's sitting on top of the barrel, which um, was a lot of fun too. And in fact, that hive there, we had it on the barrel with a spinner at the bottom so we could rotate the whole barrel. And surprisingly, the bees are fine with that. Well, that colony is anyway. Certainly got some hives that wouldn't like to be turned 360 degrees. Uh, <laughs> but that hive was totally cool with it. Fantastic. I think they're starting to wind up now with their questions on here, Seeds. We've okay. been going for a long time. Okay, last question. Good. <laughs> last question. If you were starting a hive, um, Cedar, which one would you get and why would you choose a six frame over a seven frame? Okay. So the reason why you'd choose the seven frame, which is a wider hive and matches 10 frame Langstroth uh, equipment, is just to have a bit more honey storage in both the bottom and the top, which helps in those colder climates. So there's pros and cons. The, the con is they're a bit heavier to lift your boxes off. The pros are there's a bit more storage in there, which is said to help in those long, cold, snowy places. Down in the garden here, you can see the blue hive in the middle and the hives to the right of that are the larger size and the ones to the left are the smaller size. So there's not that much difference, just two more frames in the bottom, one more flow frame in the top, and it's uh, just the way beekeeping's been done with a couple of different sizes, so we have followed suit there. If you're in the cold, snowy areas, then probably go for the larger size. Uh, otherwise, I'd recommend the smaller size. It's just a bit easier to lift your uh, honey box off when you go to do your routine brood inspections. Thank you very much for all your questions. Rainy day here, it's beginner beekeeping Q&A. A lot of great questions. If you've got answers to people's questions that we haven't answered, please jump in there and help answer. That's what it's all about. And if you want to get going with a bit of a handhold, look at thebeekeeper.org, a great online course we've put together with experts from all over the world. It's also a great fundraiser. So get in there and have a look at that as well. Thank you very much for tuning in. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next time. See you again, same time.